Right, we'll get you that update every yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, could we ask people to take their seats? We'll be starting in a moment. Um, okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president, and we're very grateful today to have an address from uh, Martin Grunberg, the chair of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and detailed comments and additional insights from a host of people who will be introduced later, including Tobias Adrian, the uh, monetary and financial counselor at the IMF. Um, the address is about a critical topic, which is too big to fail, which remains the underlying risk for a number of financial regulatory and stability challenges. And the FDIC has issued a new update, overview of resolution under Title II of the Dodd-Frank Act, which is available on the FDIC website, on the Peterson Institute website, and on good bookstores everywhere. Um, <laughs> jo joking aside, this is what, one of the things that really matters, um, as we all know. And, and so the tendency, of course, is for eyes to glaze over, even among the cognoscenti. And this is a place where the FDIC staff, their counterparts around the world, the people at the fund, the BIS, a number of institutions, Institute for International Finance as well, um, various NGOs, have all been working for several years. And this is a space where technocracy, or at least technocratic concerns, do matter. And so we're very proud at the Peterson Institute to be a place where we can convene people who want to know the details, and who want to know the intent and the design and the challenges. And we're grateful to Marty and his team at the FDIC for, for giving us that opportunity today. Um, but we should not lose sight of the big picture. Uh, 2008 reminds us all that financial stability matters and that too big to fail is a part of it. And recent events, including Credit Suisse, uh, tell us that we hadn't yet solved the problem. So whether or not this report solves the problem, I don't know, but I do know it's progress and it's a very thoughtful, serious attempt to address the ongoing issues. And so we will be fortunate to discuss that today. Um, this is about the orderly resolution of a global systemically important banking organization or a GSIB in line with US law. Um, again, this is about avoiding disruptive bankruptcy and avoiding bailouts and how you do something constructive that's neither of those. If in a capitalist system, a bank messes up and banks have to be allowed to mess up. And this is one key component. We will have a presentation by Chair Grunberg and then a question and answer a conversation with him and with Dr. Adrian, the financial counselor and director of the Monetary and Capital Markets Department at the fund. This will be followed after a brief set change uh, with a panel chaired by my colleague Anna Gelpern uh, and our own Nicholas Veron and three experts from the FDIC who contributed to this report. Art Merton, Ryan Tetrick, and Susan Baker. Let me just say this is, I believe, the third time in recent years we've been fortunate to have uh, Martin Grunberg, the Honorable Martin Grunberg, uh, at the Peterson Institute. He has been a public servant at the FDIC since August 2005, previously serving as vice chair from 2005 to July 2011, as chair from November 2012 to 2018, and was sworn in again as chairman of the FDIC Board of Directors in January of last year. Um, he's also been acting chairman. 
Martin has, Marty has uh, devoted much of his professional life to issues of bank reform and re uh, regulation and supervision. Uh, he previously served as senior counsel to Senator Paul Sarbanes on the staff of the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs from 1993 to 2005. He previously served as staff director of the Banking Committee Subcommittee on International Finance and Monetary Policy from 87 to 92. So with that, let me invite Chairman Grudenberg to our stage to discuss overview of resolution under Title II of the Dodd-Frank Act or how to save the world from too big to fail. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. And Adam, thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, I can't think of a more appropriate place to talk about the orderly failure of global systemically important banks and the Peterson Institute for International uh, Economics. The, it's the perfect, really the perfect forum because this is very much a global challenge and really appreciate the willingness of the Peterson Institute to, to give us the opportunity today to talk about the work we're doing and the paper that we are releasing today. So. Let me begin with, with that opening. My purpose today is to share some thoughts about a topic of vital importance to US financial stability, the orderly resolution of global systemically important banks, or GSIBs as, as they're called. Prior to the global financial crisis of 2008, it was generally assumed in the United States and in other major jurisdictions of the world that GSIBs were unlikely to fail. Their diversified business models combined with their diversified geographical operations supported the perception that there was little need to devote regulatory attention or resources to their potential failure. The massive public support provided to these institutions in the United States and elsewhere to, pre to prevent their failure during the 2008 financial crisis shattered, shattered that perception. We found out that they could indeed fail with, with unimaginable potential consequences. As a result, the United States, under Title II of the Dodd-Frank Act, which was enacted in 2010 in the aftermath of the crisis, provided the FDIC with dramatically expanded authorities to manage the orderly failure of a US GSIB or for that matter, any financial company whose failure was deemed to pose a risk to the US financial, to US financial stability. And importantly, similar authorities were provided to financial regulators in other major jurisdictions of the world. So this was indeed a global challenge. Since that time, the FDIC has been working diligently to develop the capability to use the expanded authorities provided for GSIB resolution under the Dodd-Frank Act. And today we are releasing a paper entitled Overview of Resolution Under Title II of the Dodd-Frank Act, which describes the progress we have made and provides the most comprehensive explanation to date of how the FDIC expects to utilize these authorities. So I would like to use the opportunity of this speech to explain at a high level, let me say. I invite you to read the paper, but I'll try to keep my comments today at a, at a, at a high plane of uh, the contents of the paper. We believe it is of critical importance 
to the success of our efforts that financial markets, policymakers, and the public have the clearest explanation possible of how the FDIC expects to manage the orderly resolution of a global systemically important bank. That's the goal of this paper and of my, my comments this morning. Now, as I indicated, the ability of the FDIC and other US regulatory authorities to manage the orderly resolution of large complex financial institutions remains foundational to US financial stability. While recognizing the progress that's been made toward enabling such a resolution, we also recognize that the resolution of a GSIB has not yet been undertaken. When it becomes necessary to do so, carrying out such a resolution will come with a unique set of challenges and risks, and I by no means want to understate uh, the challenge that will be posed. That being said, however, let me be clear that an orderly resolution, an orderly failure, is far more preferable to the alternatives, particularly the alternative of resorting to taxpayer support to prop up a failed institution or to bail out investors and creditors. With this paper, the FDIC is reaffirming that should the need arise, we are prepared to apply the resolution framework that the FDIC and other regulatory authorities in the United States and globally have worked so hard to develop over these past years. In that regard, we believe this paper is particularly timely in light of the decision by Swiss authorities last year not to place Credit Suisse into a resolution process which the Swiss had actually developed consistent with the international standard adopted by the Financial Stability Board after the 2008 crisis. That standard are the, the key attributes for effective resolution regimes for financial institutions. Instead, the Swiss chose to facilitate an open institution acquisition of Credit Suisse with public support. This was done despite the view, as detailed in an FSB, a Financial Stability Board report released last year, that the cross-border resolution framework was sound and that a resolution was ready to be implemented by the Swiss authorities. So, in my remarks today, I'll provide an overview of the resolution planning and policy developments supporting an orderly resolution of a GSIB under Title II, including the utilization of the Title I resolution plans or so-called living wills, the development of the single point of entry strategy to manage the orderly failure of a GSIB, rulemakings that have been implemented to facilitate that, and importantly, progress on international cooperation. Of particular note, I will also discuss in greater detail than has been provided previously the key operational steps for a US GSIB Title II resolution. Launching the resolution of the failed firm, stabilizing the operations of this failed firm once it's in resolution, and then exiting resolution. Those are the three stages that I will try to walk through this morning as well. Uh, let me warn you up front that this conversation can get a, big, a bit technical, so I will ask you to please bear with me as I try to work my way through this, because I do think that it's, it's important. So let me begin by reviewing resolution planning and policy developments supporting a Title II GSIB resolution. 
So first, as required by the Dodd-Frank Act, multiple cycles of Title I resolution plans, these are the living wills that the firms themselves prepare, have been and continue to be a very valuable part of our preparations for resolution. These plans require the largest US bank holding companies to demonstrate how they could be resolved under the US bankruptcy code without severe adverse effects on US financial stability and without taxpayer support. As part of that Title I process, the US GCIBs have enhanced the resolvability in a number of important ways, including, and let me just tick them off, identifying options for shrinking and divesting their businesses in resolution to reduce their systemic footprint, streamlining their organizational and funding structures, developing capabilities to estimate material subsidiaries, liquidity, and capital needs in resolution, building governance frameworks with specific triggers to promote timely action when a firm begins to encounter stress, planning for operational continuity through the resolution process, and improving transparency to markets and investors with public versions of their resolution plans and securities markets disclosures. While the strength of these plans and capabilities varies across firms, Title I provides a valuable process for ongoing supervisory review and improvements. Each iteration of these plans helps to strengthen the resolvability of these large complex banking organizations and to keep our planning up to date with the firm's current business model and market developments. In short, the work that firms put into these plans is vital to making an orderly resolution more feasible. Now, turning to Title II resolution, the FDIC's development of the single point of entry resolution strategy, which we announced back in 2013, was a critical step forward in the FDIC's, FDIC's thinking about how to address the challenges of resolving large, complex financial institutions with global operations, and it remains foundational to our planning efforts. In a single point of entry resolution, only one, only one legal entity, the parent holding company of the organization is placed into resolution. The ownership interests in the underlying subsidiaries of the company are transferred from the failed parent, from the failed holding company, to a new bridge financial company under the control of the FDIC. Under the single point of entry strategy, material subsidiaries remain open and operating while we proceed through an orderly resolution. This protects depositors, preserves value, and promotes financial stability. In a single point of entry resolution, the failed holding companies, shareholders, and unsecured creditors are not, are not transferred to the bridge financial company. They become claimants against the receivership, and they will ultimately absorb the losses of the firm. There would be no taxpayer support, and the board and senior executives of the failed firm would be removed. So just to be clear, we're going to place the holding company, which is where the shareholders are, where the creditors are, where the senior executives and board is, into an FDIC receivership. And those shareholders and creditors are going to suffer losses in accordance with the failed firm. We are going to transfer the operating subsidiaries of the firm to a bridge financial company under the control of the FDIC. 
And during the resolution process, those operating subsidiaries, which constitute the operations of the firm, will continue in order to maintain stability during the course of the resolution process. Now, to help operationalize a single point of entry resolution, in 2017, the Federal Reserve and other authorities finalized a number of rules that make single point of entry work. First, the Federal Reserve's rule on minimum total loss absorbing capacity and long-term debt ensures sufficient private sector capacity is available to absorb the losses and recapitalize the institution in resolution. Second, the clean holding company rule limits the liabilities of GSIP holding companies that are not long-term debt. That helps reduce complications and complete competing claims of the holding company creditors in resolution. And third, and importantly, requirements for GCIPs to provide for stays on counterparty actions for qualified financial contracts, such as derivatives and repos, mean that QFCs can be easily transferred to a bridge financial company or other new owner and not dis disrupt core financial markets. This was a key challenge during the 2008 financial crisis. Finally, because operations of GSIBs are global by definition, the FDIC has invested enormous effort to promote international cooperation with our key counterpart jurisdictions. We cannot overstate the importance of effective cross-border co coordination and cooperation if you're going to manage the orderly failure of a global firm operating internationally. Our work together has re resulted in robust mechanisms to pre-position resources to support the recapitalization of subsidiaries in a single point of entry resolution, to meet regularly with home and host authorities to discuss firm specific resolution plans in crisis management groups for each of these global systemically important banks, and to continue to engage with our cross-border counterparts at all levels to test our operational preparedness. These include, I would note, these engagements include biennial principal level resolution planning exercises with our UK and European Banking Union counterparts. The US, the UK, and the European Banking Union, between the three of us, are the home jurisdictions for about two thirds of all the global systemically important banks. It is really of enormous importance for these three jurisdictions to be able to work together um, on a basis of trust. And these principal level exercises where we get together the heads of the central banks, the finance ministers, and the heads of all the regulatory authorities of the three jurisdictions to spend a considerable amount of time together to work through scenarios in which we are both the home jurisdiction and the host jurisdiction, I think really cannot be overstated. And as an indication of the priority that our respective jurisdictions at the highest level place on this work. So together, these planning and policy developments support the FDIC's preparedness to undertake a Title II resolution. So, so now let me turn to the operational steps that we would have to work through in order to implement a GSID resolution under Title II. As I indicated, a Title II GSID resolution will be a challenging process under any circumstance, with a number of steps that need to be taken quickly and in close coordination with a range of stakeholders. Generally, we plan for three stages of resolution. First, launching the resolution, 
placing the failed firm into a resolution process, stabilizing the failed firm's operations in a resolution, which obviously will be critical, and third, exiting the resolution. So if I may, let me provide some more detail on our preparations and expectations for each of these three stages. So first, launching the resolution. When a GSIB approaches failure, the FDIC and other US authorities would take up that specific case to consider under those circumstances, whether, when, and how the Title II framework would be used. It's a multi-agency process, and the statutory factors guiding this decision are clearly laid out in Title II of the Dodd-Frank Act, and it's suggestive of the consequence of the decision to be made here. This process is often referred to as the three keys process because it requires recommendations from two federal agencies, the Federal Reserve and the FDIC in the case of most of the US GSIBs, followed by a determination of the Secretary of the Treasury in consultation with the President to actually commence a Title II, a Title II receivership. Part of the decision making is a determination that using Title II would mitigate the adverse effects of the firm's failure in resolution in bankruptcy. Unlike a resolution under the bankruptcy code, a Title II resolution is managed by the FDIC as the receiver. It provides for the orderly liquidation fund at the US Treasury as a line of credit to the FDIC to serve as a temporary backstop source of liquidity to sustain the operations of the failed firm through the resolution process. And to be clear, any utilization of the orderly liquidation fund will be repaid out of the assets of the failed firm with no taxpayer exposure. These are large firms large volumes of assets, we would have every expectation that those assets could support any borrowing that might be required from the Treasury's orderly liquidation fund. Access to the orderly liquidation fund requires an orderly liquidation plan agreed upon with the Secretary of the Treasury that lays out the expected resolution strategy. As described above, the FDIC expects that the orderly liquidation plan would be based on a single point of entry strategy, which the FDIC consider, considers the most suitable resolution strategy in a range of potential scenarios involving resolution of a US GSIB. The single point of entry strategy would mitigate financial stability risk as I indicated, keep key subsidiaries open and operating and continue critical operations. Launching the actual entry into resolution involves a number of steps that happen concurrently. For a GSIB resolution using a single point of entry strategy, the parent holding company of the failed GSIB is placed into receivership. The FDIC as receiver would establish a bridge financial company under the FDIC's control, and the FDIC would determine the leadership and the governance of this bridge company. It would transfer the operating subsidiaries of the failed uh, holding company to the bridge financial company and commence the claims process. Importantly, and I underscore this point. At the point of entry, the board of directors of the failed GSIB and the senior executives who were responsible for the failure would not be retained by the Bridge Financial Company. The Dodd-Frank Act also provides authority 
for compensation clawbacks for senior executives who are considered to be substantially responsible for the company's failure, and as mentioned previously, the failed firm's shareholders and creditors will ultimately absorb the losses of the firm with no taxpayer exposure. Now, the FDIC has prepared for these steps in advance. We've drafted legal documents to establish the bridge company and its governance structure, built a program that maintains a roster of qualified and vetted executives to run the bridge financial company. That's actually a very important program that we've organized and identified an extraordinary group of former executives of large financial institutions who would be able to step in and assist us in this, in this circumstance. And we've also retained contractors to scale up work on communications, employee retention, and claims administration. Throughout this process, the FDIC aims for a balanced approach to bridge governance and oversight with the FDIC retaining control over key strategic decisions and ensuring compliance with the orderly liquidation plan and repayment of the orderly liquidation fund, while the new bridge financial company's leadership manages the day-to-day -day operations of the bridge company. So that's stage one. The second stage of resolution stabilizing the operations of the failed firm begins as soon as the firm enters resolution. A key advantage of the single point of entry strategy is that by keeping material subsidiaries open and operating, it enables the firm's material operations to continue. The, new, the newly formed bridge financial company would be backed by orderly liquidation fund liquidity or guarantees to the extent needed and have a strong balance sheet with ample capital because the failed firm's liabilities were left behind in the receivership to absorb losses while the assets of the failed firm are transferred to the bridge financial company. This puts the bridge company in a strong position to use its internal resources to take any actions that may be needed immediately upon entry into resolution to recapitalize material domestic and foreign subsidiaries, to provide liquidity support, and to maintain continuity of operations. These actions will be supported by a comprehensive communications effort coordinated among the FDIC, other US and international authorities, and the Bridge Financial Company. I really cannot overstate the importance of effective communications as part of this whole process. Even if we do everything right, if the financial markets and others don't believe we can do what we are doing, if we don't, if we're not able to sustain their confidence, this, this, this whole exercise will not be successful. This effort, this communications effort, will be designed to provide clarity and understanding of the resolution to a range of critical stakeholders, including staff of the Bridge Financial Company and its subsidiaries, customers of the company, counterparties, various public authorities, and the wider public. So let me be clear if I haven't been already. While single point of entry means that the original holding company would fail with the consequences of failure, the new bridge financial company and its material subsidiaries will be open and operating. Market participants should be confident that these subsidiaries will continue providing critical services and functions to the market and fulfill contractual obligations to employees counterparties and customers. That's the needle to thread here is um, maintaining financial stability 
and the operations of the failed firm through the resolution process while imposing accountability on the firm's stakeholders, the shareholders, the creditors, the senior executives, and the board. So now the third stage is exiting from this process. Once the operating subsidiaries are stabilized, the FDIC and the Bridge Financial Company Management expect to focus on developing and implementing the restructuring and wind down plan for this company. Leveraging the GSIB's Title I plan, the FDIC will already have analyzed prior to the failure possible restructuring, divestiture, and wind down actions to occur in resolution and incorporated our own expectations into the resolution strategy for the firm. The type and extent of restructuring will depend on the nature of the firm's business, the causes of failure, and the economic and market conditions at the time. For example, an appropriate restructuring plan could include selling subsidiaries or specific business lines, winding down or liquidating specific portfolios, business lines, or subsidiaries in an orderly manner, or breaking up certain operating subsidiaries for sale or spinoff. Any restructuring will aim to maintain value, continue, continue or transition critical operations, address the causes of failure, and ensure that the entity or entities emerging from the Bridge Financial Company can be resolved under the bankruptcy code or other ordinarily applicable regime in an orderly fashion. In other words, we do not want to have to resort to an extraordinary set of authorities such as Title II. Ongoing restructuring and divestiture requirements could also continue after exit from resolution by virtue of conditions placed on acquirers or mandated by other supervisory or regulatory requirements. The FDIC expects to exit resolution in a timely fashion with the failed GSIBs, shareholders and creditors rather than the taxpayers absorbing the losses of the failed firm. The FDIC expects that the most, most likely mechanism for exiting resolution will be what we call a securities for claims exchange. In this approach, new debt and equity securities in the successor company or companies are distributed to the former creditors of the failed firm to satisfy the claims against the receivership. They'll be taking big losses, by the way, in this process. Once the securities are distributed, the bridge financial company is terminated, and the successor company or companies will be owned by the former claimants. While the timeline may vary depending on the scenario, completion of all the steps needed for the securities for claims exchange, making claims determinations, estimating value, valuation of any successor company or companies, and issuing and distributing new securities to claimants will be arranged during the bridge period, which is likely to take at least nine months. This will allow sufficient time for the FDIC and the Bridge Financial Company to issue the audited financial statements, prospectuses, and necessary disclosures in order for the successor company or companies to comply with the requirements of federal securities laws. Again, our goal is that when a GSIB exits resolution, it no longer presents a systemic threat to the US financial system and can be resolved under the ordinarily applicable resolution regime. So let me conclude here by acknowledging that a US GSIB failure 
will be extraordinarily challenging under any circumstances. Needless to say, we have yet to execute an orderly resolution of the U.S. GCIP. And look, until we do so successfully, there will be questions as to whether it can be done. No doubt about it. Our purpose in issuing the paper today is to explain as clearly and in as much detail as possible how the FDIC expects to carry out that critical resolution responsibility. We believe we have the authorities, the resources, and the capabilities to do the job if it becomes necessary. We hope this paper generates interest in this issue. We stand ready to engage with all interested parties to address questions and build further understanding of the FDIC's plans and preparedness for executing our Title II Dodd-Frank Act resolution responsibilities for GSIBs. We really welcome and invite engagement on this issue. Well, let me say that's my story for this morning, and I'm, and I'm sticking to it. So thank you all very much. Thank you. There we go. Uh, thank you, Chair Grunberg. Uh, let me also welcome to the stage, as previously mentioned, Dr. Tobias Adrian. Sorry, I'm mangling pronunciation today. Um, who is the financial counselor and director of the Monetary and Capital Markets Department of the International Monetary Fund, uh, previously senior vice president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Um, he leads the IMF's work on financial sector surveillance, monetary macroprudential policies, digital money, and particularly relevant for today, financial regulation and bank resolution. Um, Marty, I mean, sorry, Adrian, uh, Tobias. Um, you've been part of the discussions, both the formal discussions around these international efforts but also the intellectual and broad policy discussions about GSIB resolution and financial stability for some time. Could you give a bit of an international perspective on what the chair just proposed in the US, both in two senses. First, how does it compare to what other countries that have GSIBs do? And second, how does it line up with the international coordination as you understand it? Yeah, thanks so much, Adam, and um, thanks for uh, having me uh, on this panel. Um, you know, we are a little bit over a year after bank failures in both the U.S. and Switzerland. Um, in the U.S., those were regional banks, not GSEPs, but in Switzerland, of course, it was a GSEP. And I would argue that uh, the events last year were really the first significant mm -hmm. test uh, of the resolution regime globally. Um, in our view, there is a lot of progress that has been made, um, but there's further work required globally. And let me, let me be uh, more precise. Um, on the one hand, um, clearly uh, the turmoil last year was contained, right? And that's true both uh, in Switzerland and the US. Um, unlike many failures previously, such as in 2008 uh, that Marty referred to, um, the losses last year were shared with the shareholders and some creditors, particularly in the Swiss case. However, as Marty also noted, taxpayers in Switzerland were again on the hook as substantial public support was provided. Um, 
And of course, in the US, uninsured depositors were also made full in those two failures, um, you know, which incurred the cost of the FDIC, which is then borne by the banking system, but which ultimately is going to be a, a cost to uh, either the clients or the, or the shareholders of those uh, banks. So let me start uh, by saying that uh, uh, we really welcome uh, the significant efforts of the FDIC and other U.S. authorities uh, to draw lessons from the Burger King terminal last year. The FDIC has published uh, a report on Boston insurance options. There have been uh, proposals on expanding uh, living wills and long-term debt requirements uh, to a broader set of institutions. And of course, preemptive supervision is, uh, is very first order and, and back in, in focus. Um, we have also seen this morning, just about uh, two or three hours ago, um, an extensive report by the Swiss Finance Ministry on how uh, the uh, too big to fail uh, reforms can be furthered in Switzerland following uh, the Credit Suisse uh, failure. Um, of course, the US policy proposals uh, have been at the forefront of global developments uh, for uh, um, you know, over 10 years um, since, since the Dodd-Frank Act uh, was, uh, was uh, launched. Um, you know, we take uh, occasionally a very, very close look at resolution in the financial sector assessments. We did so in 2020. And um, at that time, we, we flagged really the scope for resolution planning uh, as well as uh, the loss of absorbing capacity that should be expanded to a broader set of institutions. And the proposals that I've referred to were doing uh, just that. Uh, the paper today is really about Title II uh, uh, resolution. So this is the Orderly Liquidation Authority. Um, and that would be applied to globally systemic important uh, institutions or some other institutions uh, in the context of heightened systemic risk. Um, so in principle, Title I would be tried, which are the, the traditional um, um, uh, liquidation uh, authorities. And Title II is really a systemic risk um, uh, a step. And the paper that uh, Marty explained is extremely valuable, um, and not just in the US context, but in this global context. So um, foreign resolution authorities will be responsible for handling the non-U.S. operations of U.S. Uh, groups. And so these cross-border issues are very important for global financial stability. Um, so, for example, when SVB failed last year, which was a regional, not a GSEP, um, the U.K. subsidiary was resolved by the Bank of England and ultimately being sold to HSBC. And this close relationship between the U.S. authorities and the British authorities uh, I would argue, were absolutely key. Um, and when you think back of 2008, uh, when there was an attempt to get Lehman uh, sold before it failed for bankruptcy, um, this sort of like operational readiness in terms of cross-border cooperation really wasn't there. And um, there are many accounts uh, of those uh, uh, days, and um, uh, I do think we have made significant progress in terms of having this close cooperation. Um, so I do think uh, global financial stability is in a better place. Um, you know, so you know, a GCIP being resolved has implications for the rest of the world, but of course, a GCIP elsewhere also has important U.S. Uh, implications, and that was uh, uh, became clear in the Credit Suisse case, and is um, related to the depth of U.S. capital markets, right? Because typically, foreign GSIPs issue securities in U.S. security markets, um, and so you know when Credit Suisse was um, not resolved but was merged, um, 
there was a question of whether what would be called TLAC in the US, so these uh, longer term debt would be bailed in, and there are still some security market uh, issues around that. Those are securities uh, that are issued under New York law, and the disclosure regime is not entirely, uh, entirely obvious there. Finally, let me just also underline the importance of liquidity and resolution. So the US framework is very clear. Uh, the Fed has powers, the FDIC has powers, uh, the Treasury plays an important role, um, and the orderly liquidation fund is, is, is really key. And this is where other jurisdictions really have some way to go. Um, so I do think uh, that uh, the US framework is, um, is you know, very, very uh, uh, well developed. And this paper uh, really helps in terms of explaining how uh, a GSEB uh, in the US would be resolved. Thank you very much, Tobias. Um, let me try to just ask a couple follow-up questions since we have both of you. Um, but then we will be transitioning to a panel with additional experts and perspectives. Um, first off, just and and the among the many things under resolution planning that we speak about and that Marty speaks about is establishing triggers for timely action. And you both know well, we all know well, whether it's Silicon Valley Bank, Lehman, Credit Suisse, that that in a sense is one of the big elephants in the room that motivating senior policy makers and politicians to take early action is difficult. So I guess I just like a little bit on sort of the meta question, which is does making the orderly resolution seem more tangible, more doable, affect the willingness of policymakers to be preemptive? Does this provide any behavioral pressure on the banks or on investors to make them behave differently? Or is it just, this is sound if we get to this situation, but we're not able to force the hand of policymakers in this situation? I mean, From my standpoint, um, being prepared in a critical, in a, in, a, in a credible way is critical to having the confidence in the moment to make the decision to place a global company into resolution. I, I don't think anybody should underestimate the um, uh, the scale of the decision to place a global firm with trillions of dollars of assets, uh, complex operations uh, into a public resolution process. That's a tough decision to make, uh, even in the best of circumstances. And that's really, frankly, our, our whole effort here is to put in place um, a, uh, a planning process uh, and operational preparations so that we would have sufficient confidence if confronted with such a circumstance, you know, to be willing to pull the trigger and not blink. Right. And that's really the key thing. And that's, you know, and we would need to have the confidence of our own institution and under our legal framework the other major agencies of our government, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury, um, and ultimately the, in, in consultation with the president, would have to share that confidence. So it's a, it is no small task. It's really why we've been working so hard. Uh, we think we've made, made some progress, a lot of it, and we thought this paper would have some value to try to lay out uh, in as much detail as we could, you know, how we would envision undertaking it. Um, and as I indicated, welcome engagement with all interested parties. It's a, it's a complex and challenging task. And the more interactions we have with interested stakeholders, I think the better. 
Yeah, so let me uh, point to, to three issues. So one, uh, I think, is the operational preparedness, which is absolutely key. Um, uh, so having uh, regular uh, forward-looking uh, exercises mm -hmm. is, is absolutely key. And um, I think this is where the US is really uh, a, a, a fantastic uh, example. Um, um, you know, having said that, um, you know, this is not the case in every, every country. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, even, even, even in the US, right, uh, when you think of the SVB case, which is not a GSIP, which is a, a small institution, but, you know, the uh, discount window preparedness of the institution was actually so, like, uh, lacking in, in retrospect. So, you know, really pushing institutions to plan for crisis events is, is, is absolutely key. And um, uh, this liquidity aspect, right, um, pre-positioning collateral and having liquidity available is, uh, is very first order. And I think uh, the paper is, is explaining that uh, extremely well. The second issue are the powers. So do you have the powers to get things done? Um, uh, here, the, the Credit Suisse uh, case is, again, uh, instructive as um, there was an emergency law that was passed on the weekend uh, of the resolution, right? And ideally, you wouldn't have to sort of do that uh, on, on that weekend. So uh, as Marty explained, so like uh, all, the, uh, all the rules and mechanisms are put in place in the U.S., uh, and then the third thing is the marketplace, right? Um, you know, are investors actually prepared for what it means when uh, TLAC, long-term debt, or in uh, uh, European jurisdictions, those convertible debt securities are being converted? You know, what that means. And clearly, last year, there were some surprises where sort of like the fine print of those contracts which were very clear, suddenly came into focus in the marketplace. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really the public sector, the institution, and the marketplace that has to have a preparedness. And um, it, is, it is always work in progress on all three fronts. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask two more questions, and then we are going to turn over the stage. Um, first is, Billy, on what you just said, Tobias, and I commend you both as responsible public officials talking frankly about the facts of what happened with Credit Suisse, what happened with SVB and First Republic in the US. Um, on the Credit Suisse example, one might have thought going in that Switzerland would maybe not be the UK in terms of close working relationships with the US, but pretty darn close, right? They're in all the crisis management groups. Yeah. Their representatives are in all the Basel committees. They have sophisticated people. They interact. Um, and also, to be blunt, we had a major um, set of US Swiss um, I don't know what the right word is, let's say engagement over past issues with Credit Suisse and, and the Swiss banking system. So not to point fingers at any individuals, but from the point of view of international coordination, what was it you think didn't work in that case, that they so clearly deviated from what was agreed international norms? So I'm happy to start, and you know, Marty or, or already mentioned uh, this FSB report. Right. Um, Just you know, came out, so I haven't read it yet. <laughs> so it's fascinating reading if you if you like um, um, uh, resolution issues. Uh, so um, you know, the uh, Credit Suisse was not taken into resolution; it was a merger outside of resolution. Our view is, and I think that's aligned with what uh, Marty was alluding to, is that a merger could have been done in resolution, right? right. So resolution uh, in general, in the FSB context, so I, here I'm not talking about OLA or in Title II, the US context, but the FSB framework in principle does allow resolution 
that results in a merger. And I would just point out that um, you know, last year, uh, Credit Suisse was over $500 billion in terms of size. When you add up the three regional banks in the US, they're nearly right. another 500 billion. So, you know, it was, you know, not a systemic crisis, but quite a significant turmoil. So in our view, um, you know, the merger could have been done in resolution. The first order difference would have been that the value of the equity would have been entirely written down. There was a little bit of value left of $3 billion. Um, but um, you know, the, uh, there would have been certain advantages to go in this formal FSB you know, type resolution framework in our view. Um, now, having said that, we do think that the outcome was good from a global financial stability point of view. You know, the so like systemic pressures abated very quickly. And it's the quick action both in Switzerland and the US uh, by the FDSC, the Federal Reserve, uh, and uh, in Switzerland, the SNB and FINMA, you know, that really contained any, any broader fallout. But we do think there are lessons in terms of preparedness, um, in terms of thinking not just about one way of resolution, but alternative ways of how to go about a resolution you know, not just plan A, but also plan B. And in the US, that is wired into Title I and Title II. Um, um, and, it, you know, so there's certainly, certainly scope uh, to do more. Uh, and the planning, the operational readiness, the liquidity and resolution, these are all issues that should be, you know, totally sorted out up front. Thank you. Marty? Yeah. Um, first, it's really a question to ask the Swiss. As a, I understand, but um, they may not be quite as objective. The, and, and, but let me say there, <laughs> there, there was um, extensive um, interactions with the Swiss authorities, the US, the UK authorities, uh, and others uh, through the crisis management group relating to Credit Suisse in the run-up let's call it the failure of the institution. Um, and the Financial Stability Board report, you know, indicated that the Swiss were indeed prepared, as to, to be as suggested, to uh, execute a resolution. And they made their choice not to. And to facilitate a um, merger acquisition of the firm, with open institution public support. It had the benefit as to be as indicated of, of maintaining financial stability, but there, there was a lack of accountability. That effectively, the shareholders of the firm were protected as were the um, TLAC bondholders. And that has consequences in terms of market expectations that are problematic and are core objective of the whole uh, international resolution framework that's been developed in the period since the, the 2008 crisis. And, and indeed, uh, one of the things the FSB report points out that in conversations with TLAC bondholders of Credit Suisse, their surprise was that those bonds were not haircut. I mean, those were the terms under which they invested in the bonds. Those were their expectations. Right. And so that, you know, and that's um, an expectation, frankly, we want to maintain, because right. that goes to important market discipline and expectations right. around this whole issue. So um, it's one of the reasons I think the Financial Stability Board in its report reaffirmed its commitment and confidence in the international resolution framework. And it's one of the reasons, I should say, we began work on our report well before last year's events. But um, we did do see it as an opportunity on our end to reaffirm our confidence and commitment uh, to an orderly resolution process and to try to lay out 
you know, why we think we would be in a position to, to execute on it if, if necessary. Thank you. Uh, one last question. The, having both of you here, the other hot, important regulatory topic, a supervisor regulatory topic, is what's referred to as the Basel III endgame. In fact, Marty, last June, you came and you gave a speech here about that. Um, and obviously, the US position, seemingly that of the Federal Reserve, seems to have shifted a lot. Um, let me just put, speaking just for myself, let me just put cards on the table for you to address. My understanding of the research in, in the history, including work done at the FDIC, at the IMF, at Peterson, and other places, is that there's no example of a increase in regulatory capital leading to a credit crunch in the US, and very few, if any, clear examples of that happening elsewhere. That the, despite what's being said by some interested parties, the main incidents, as it were, of increasing this kind of capital would be on the largest banks, and therefore not necessarily affecting small business borrowers and such who are the province of smaller banks. And that, and this gets a little more contentious, the first two are facts, this, this last one is probably a fact, that if such a rise in capital were to provide additional insurance against 2008 events, or even Credit Suisse events, um, it would be worth even on a, on a social welfare basis, a small contraction in credit for a short time. So recognizing that both of you are constrained by political realities, given these facts, either correct me if I'm wrong on the facts as I understand them, or what should the US be thinking about? It, and what are international bodies saying to the US in this context? <laughs> So let me say that, um, that I agree that uh, the uh, Basel III capital rulemaking is critically important to the long-term uh, resilience and stability of the US banking system. And I think the US remains very committed to following through on that rulemaking. Uh, we've received a lot of thoughtful comment I think we're working through the process, as we always do, of considering the comments. I think we're expecting you know, to make changes um, as a result of the comments we've received. And I think we're, we're working through that process. And, and I'm hopeful uh, that the US will be able to um, you know, complete action on the rulemaking, working in collaboration with the three banking agencies. Okay. Yeah, so. Um, our view as an international body is that um, the uh, Basel III um, standards are minimum standards that should be phased in um, by all uh, banking regulatory agencies uh, around the world. And the proposed rule is indeed implementing uh, those uh, minimum standards. Um, now, these are minimum standards, so countries can go above the minimum standards, and uh, the proposed rule had gone above the minimum in some dimensions. And my understanding is that um, um, in, in, in this uh, process, uh, there's an assessment of what the final rule uh, is going to be. Um, so our view is you know, the Basel III standard should be viewed uh, as a minimum. And um, you know, in our view, it should be applied broadly uh, across uh, the, the spectrum of, of sizes of banks. Um, the US has um, this uh, regulatory uh, tiering of group one, two, three, and four banks. And our view is that uh, these uh, Basel standards should be applied uh, as, as a minimum uh, to, uh, to all banks. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking uh, Tobias Adrian, the financial counselor and director of the Monetary and Capital Markets Department at the International Monetary Fund, 
and Martin Grunberg, the chair of the board of directors of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation of the United States. Thank you. Um, we ask that our uh, in-person uh, guests stay with us and that our online audience multitask for only five minutes. Uh, we will be right back with the following panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.
an orderly resolution of globally systemic important banks. We're very privileged not only to have had this morning a speech by FDIC Chair Martin Grunberg and commentary and engaging so uh, with IMF Financial Counselor uh, Tobias Adrian, but we're now going to have a further in-depth discussion of this issue with colleagues from the FDIC senior staff who worked on the report, uh, Nicholas Veron from here at the Peterson Institute, and my colleague, uh, Anna Gelpern, who will chair the session and more properly introduce the participants. Just to remind everyone, Anna Gelpern has been a, uh, I of course took the wrong folder, uh, Anna Gelpern has been a, a a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for many years and a trusted uh, colleague on issues of international debt, uh, debt resolution, banking issues, international lending, has been an advisor at U.S. Treasury, at the IMF, at UNCTAD, um, and is the co-founder and motivating intellectual force of DebtCon, which is uh, the leading uh, intellectual forum for combining academic and practical uh, thinking about international debt issues across economics and law. So she is also a distinguished professor of law at the Georgetown University Law School. Anna, over to you, please. Great. Well, thank you so much, Adam, and thank you to our guests. And um, it is not often that you get to delve into the just technical detail in the big ideas and the way they interact after a big speech. So I really feel like this is an incredible treat, right, where, where we, get a, we get to ask about the legislative intent um, and uh, really uh, have dialogue on that score. And uh, I am very grateful to um, our colleagues here, Susan Baker, who is a senior advisor in the systemic risk branch of the Division for Complex Institution Supervision and Resolution. She has worked on many, many interagency and international policy and um, strategy issues. Um, she coordinates FDIC's participation in FSOC, the Financial Stability Oversight Council. Um, and I cannot skip the fact that she uh, worked on these issues at the US Treasury before, and that um, I hadn't known this, that like me, actually, you sort of got into this uh, with uh, the Asian financial crisis in Indonesia. That's the first time I met a bank examiner, and that was amazing. Um, OK. Um, Ryan Tetrick uh, is a deputy director of uh, resolution readiness uh, in FDIC's division of complex uh, institution supervision. And as we've heard from the chairman, resolution readiness and planning is uh, in many ways the heart of this exercise. Um, and uh, you know, he's had an integral role in advancing the resolution planning aspect of uh, uh, Dodd-Frank implementation uh, for CIFIs um, and uh, has been active uh, in the Financial Stability Board's uh, work stream on uh, these issues, uh, including bail-in execution, which is has to be exciting. Um, uh, Arthur Merton uh, is, uh, knows everything about all of this. Um, is the short story. The slightly longer story is that he is the deputy to uh, the chair for financial stability. He's responsible for overseeing deposit insurance resolution and research responsibilities at the FDIC uh, and provides strategic leadership for the FDIC's international outreach um, and the work with cross-border uh, institutions, which again is one of the biggest challenges in this area. Uh, my friend and colleague Nicola Veron um, is a senior fellow here. He also founded and happens to be senior fellow at Bruegel, um, which is the Brussels-based think tank. Um, the most exciting thing he has done ever is to host financial statements, which I recommend to everybody, is a uh, terrific um, uh, virtual uh, series uh, here at Peterson. 
Uh, he is a French citizen, so he does represent the rest of the world on this panel. Um, good luck. Um, and uh, of course, he is uh, the foremost expert on uh, financial systems, financial reforms around the world, sir, um, including uh, global financial uh, regulatory developments and this little thing called the European Banking Union. So with that, um, what I would like to do is just ask our guests um, and Nicola as a co-host, I guess, um, to uh, say a few words about, uh, to elaborate on some themes for the paper. Uh, we will go a little bit late, and partly because we really should, um, and we would love to hear from you and take some questions. Um, so with that, um, if uh, we could start with Susan and uh, just really talking about the paper's goal, what's new, why now? After all, the crisis was a little bit ago, and Dodd Frank was almost 15 years ago. So, hey, no time like now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, obviously, the goal of the paper was really to increase transparency about the FDIC's preparedness to undertake a Title II resolution. Setting clear expectations uh, is critical to financial stability. We need to explain what we're going to do, and when we do it, then that will help calm, calm the waters. So the idea behind this paper is that we provide a roadmap that everyone can turn to when, um, when there, so there are fewer surprises when, uh, if and when we have to do this. You know, we, reading this paper, people should know, investors in the holding company should know that they're the ones that will be bearing loss in the cost of, of the resolution. Customers and counterparties should know that the material subsidiaries will remain open and operating. Um, so the obligations will continue to be met, services will continue, and we hope that policymakers and other authorities in the general public know that there is a plan for orderly wind down and that has accountability for management and will protect the taxpayers. So what's new in this report, I guess, is a question. Um, as a good bureaucrat, everyone knows what your principal has said publicly in various fora. This was an attempt to write it all down in one place's place in an easy to understand uh, format. But it does go into depth on certain elements in a, in a way that is probably new. Uh, we do lean in, for example, on the single point of entry strategy as the FDIC's preferred strategy for resolving GSIBs. Uh, we spend a lot of time explaining the cross-border preparedness that we have uh, organized uh, from pre-positioning resources, resolution planning, crisis management groups, and the information sharing structures that we've set up. We talk a lot about the uh, mechanisms for restructuring the GSIB operations once it's in resolution. How would we wind down and sell off different operations to make the firm smaller and less systemic than the one that failed? Uh, we also clarify some key milestones in the claims process and how losses will be allocated. There's, we haven't really said anything about Title II claims that I'm aware of. Um, and then finally, we focus in on our exit plan, which would be to carry out a securities for claims exchange and how that would work. And there is a lot, as you could tell from the chairman's speech, a lot of detail in, in this paper, which we hope that people will find reassuring if we ever have to use our Title II authorities. And when we think about why now, we, why issuing this now? Yes, as the chairman said, we were working on this paper well before last year. Um, but you know, in 2008, we had two bad outcomes. We had disorderly failure or bailout, and resolution gives us that third option for an orderly process that still holds the shareholders and creditors and managers accountable, but protects financial stability and without ta cost to the taxpayer. So it's time to say that now, like what is the story of when is the best time to plant a tree 20 years ago? Uh, the second best time is today. So we are putting this paper out so that people can set their expectations and hopefully that will under uh, underpin uh, financial stability when we need it. Yeah, so it makes for a great meditation exercise. Just close your eyes and visualize you know, <laughs> in great detail what Title II is going to feel like. Um, so uh, the point about market expectations, and I think that um, Tobias mentioned this uh, earlier, uh, is a tricky one. And I think this is, you know, Ryan, your bailiwick is planning. And planning is this weird thing 
because on the one hand, um, if you plan it, it might just become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And in this context, you know, you sometimes hear if you plan for Title II, then Title I, then bankruptcy will never happen. That's sort of one story, right? The other story is that we have all of these planning processes and they never come true quite, right? I mean, we could, it would be kind of nice if we just had a completely contradiction in terms, harmless SIFI that we could just put into resolution, show everybody could be done. But so uh, why do you think you can do this and what is it about this framework, right, that avoids the two extremes where you're foreclosing some options that are supposed to be to go first, like bankruptcy, right? But at the same time, you know, it, it, you're defying history and what you're planning for is actually credible. So there are a couple aspects to that question. I'll, t I'll take them. You know, on um, bankruptcy and the Title II process, I mean, we think of those as complementary. We've tried to address the two requirements in a complementary way so that the things that the institutions are doing to plan for bankruptcy are all things that we would draw on. And I think it's really important, you know, we sometimes hear that the, um, the, the resolution planning process is an abstract process, that living wills are just large stacks of paper, and that completely misunderstands what's going on here. The institutions have had to make you know, significant changes to the way that they're organized. They've reduced hundreds of legal entities. They have pre-placed resources at material subsidiaries so that they can stay open and operating in resolution. And all of those things are supportive of both a bankruptcy resolution and a Title II resolution. That's put institutions in a place where bankruptcy can work in the right circumstances. Um, and there's certainly scenarios where it might not work, which is why it's important to have this, this uh, backup authority in Title II. And I'll just say, I think you know, the key differentiator is likely going to be liquidity. Do the institutions enter into bankruptcy at a time when they have sufficient liquidity to carry out their bankruptcy plan? And if we're not highly confident that, that, that that's the case, then Title II provides us with the important additional tool of the orderly liquidation fund. Um, and then on you know, this, this issue of certainty versus flexibility generally and in, in, in a Title II resolution, uh, look, you know, the, what we've laid out in this paper is a framework, and it's intended to be a framework that has some flexibility around it. And in particular, you know, we're going to need to be responsive to the way that this, a particular institution fails, what its particular um, business model weaknesses were, what the risk management lapses were, and address those through the course of resolution. So the types of restructuring or divestitures that occur, there's a lot of flexibility around that. What we've tried to describe here, though, is a process that has certain elements which are predictable, because it's important that there's also elements that are predictable. Creditors and shareholders of the holding company will take loss, management will be removed, taxpayers won't be exposed to risk, um, and then subsidiaries will be recapitalized, have access to liquidity, and there'll be a process where we exit from resolution and what exits is smaller and simpler and less systemic. Those elements are predictable. There's a lot of flexibility around that. I appreciate that. And then um, and I want to I want to come back to this the uh, kind of trade-offs between predictability, flexibility among predictability, flexibility, and accountability, right? Which is sort of an interesting point um, that emerges from this. Um, our, I would love to uh, just draw on your wisdom and uh, to put last spring's events, transpose them into GSIB context. What can we learn, right? So um, as, again, I, I think I'm just totally mimicking here with, or drawing on Tobias's interventions, but, you know, together this was pretty systemic. Um, and it was certainly systemic, um, you know, for um, the least cost purposes. Right, but it wasn't systemic in the GSIB way. Um, I think I've now put everybody to sleep. So what are the lessons of last spring recognizing it's a different set of institutions? Sure, sure. So, well, a couple things. Um, well, one, things can happen very quickly. I mean, we, we knew that, but we really experienced that. And um, I think we were able to respond quite quickly to the, to the events. So that was, a, in a sense, a useful drill. Um, 
you know, uh, we operated two bridge banks, and you know, we talk a lot about bridge banks, but in in reality, we prior to last spring, we had only had really one meaningful experience with the bridge bank that was IndyMac, uh, where we operated that for a number of months before uh, selling it, um, and that was quite a different experience. The business model was different. The reason for failure was different, and so these were these were new experiences in in taking over and running a bridge operations and, and then disposing of them uh, or selling them. And you know, one of the features, and and the chairman mentioned it, was you know the use of the CEOs that we had planned for. We had we had engaged them yeah. before that. Um, we had relationships with them. They got calls Sunday morning, and they were on planes and at the institutions, uh, you know, that that afternoon, that evening. And they did a, they both did a very good job of running the organizations. It was really helpful. It was a really positive uh, uh, aspect of it. Um, what we also learned was that was not so positive was the communication challenge. Um, the, a lot of the customers, suppliers. Um, counterparties of didn't really understand what a bridge bank was that it was going to continue operations and so they uh, we had to spend a lot of time early on communicating and trying to get them to conduct business as usual I mean an example was one of the CEOs when he got there that Sunday night wanted to buy dinner for all the employees because they were going to work all night and they wouldn't accept the credit card of the of the failed institution so he had to use his own, and, and the company pr providing the conference line didn't want to use there. So there were little challenges like that. More importantly, payroll pro service providers didn't want to do business with it, and that was a real problem, and we had to work on that. So that was one of the lessons that we learned there. And then just finally, um, one of the things that came out of last spring was that it's important for people to understand the difference between our resolution authorities under Title II, OLA, versus our n normal resolution authorities under the FDI Act. And there was some, I think, confusion about how those two interact. Thank you. So uh, this is super helpful and lots of follow-up questions. But um, Nicola, sir, um, what have you learned that you didn't know? And um, are you, how reassured are you after reading this report, representing the rest of the world, mind you? Uh, disclosure, I, um... disclosure, I have a, a Swiss great grandmother, so you know all my connections. Well, there, there. you go. So like, um, any questions about I had, Credit uh, Suisse? I never met her. Um, uh, OK. Uh, we learned a lot. This was a systemic crisis that qualifies as such. A systemic risk exception was triggered in the US. Uh, Credit Suisse uh, was a GSEB. So that was a big event, even so it was uh, very brief. And things got back to the semblance of normal pretty quickly. Uh, so I think it's important to emphasize the magnitude of the event and the fact that there are many lessons. Uh, I will find it difficult to limit myself to the paper, but I want to start with the paper saying uh, it's a very important contribution. Uh, maybe it's not been sufficiently emphasized uh, out of um, uh, shyness by previous speakers, but uh, so FDIC is the second authority globally, to my knowledge, that does this. The first where the Bank of England. They've done what they call the Purple Book for a number of years. Uh, this is a very similar document. Uh, there are, to my knowledge, no other similar documents in other jurisdictions, so I think it does put pressure on other jurisdictions, including the Eurozone, the UK, and, uh, not the UK, so Switzerland and others, uh, to uh, do that kind of thing. So, so that's very interesting. Um, the other thing, taking a step back, that I would want to say is that the, a lot of this business of resolution is about the capacity to actually act and make things happen the way they should in a crisis. So it's not just about the abstract authority. It's about operational capacity. And I think this was a very important point. Art just mentioned it, you know, the list of CEOs that you can, you know, rent a CEO uh, on demand uh, and that kind of things. Uh, not many authorities in the world have that, and I think uh, one of the positive things that can be said about last year's events in the U.S. is that the FDIC does have that capacity. It still has it, 
It had demonstrated it in the great uh, financial crisis uh, 15 years ago. Uh, it has demonstrated it again, and, and, and I want to insist that this is rare in the world. Now, very briefly taking a step back, what were the lessons of last year? A bit echoing uh, art, but uh, framing it from an international perspective even more in a way. I mean, in the US, there was what you could call a breach of market discipline, or at least an extraordinary measure with the triggering of the systemic risk exception, which was used to uh, reassure exactly the kind of uninsured depositors, and in an ideal world, we wouldn't want to have to reassure, you know, very uh, wealthy tycoons in Silicon Valley. I'm exaggerating, but there was a lot of that. Um, in Switzerland, there was this kind of glitch in the hierarchy of claims that uh, Chair uh, Grunberg has emphasized. Some shareholders got some money, not a lot, but some, uh, while some people who, in principle, were better protected uh, got no money. And I also want to say, in the Eurozone, in the UK, uh, there was resilience uh, in the face of a similar uh, interest rate risk. So, so I think all this brings question. If I have, and I will stop there, to compare the two breaches of market discipline, if that's the right way to characterize them, uh, the fact that the US had to invoke the systemic risk exemption, and I have come to the conclusion, like others, that they didn't really have a choice. They had to do that given the circumstances. Uh, and the fact that Switzerland uh, made little uh, cuts in the hierarchy of claims, I think the biggest concern is actually about what happened in the US. So I think in terms of the general framing, uh, that's an important uh, thing to um, keep in mind. Thank you. So uh, thank you all. This is very thought provoking because a couple of things come out of your combined comments. One is that communications in crisis and communications right now are a very different matter, right? So we have this incredibly detailed, and I insist that this is great meditation exercise, right? Um, very detailed, very rich, very granular, just as it should be, right? This is a communications document. Um, that is targeting multiple stakeholders, right? So I, I think uh, you know you mentioned um, there are the customers that we want to reassure. There are the shareholders and long-term debt holders that we want to say, hey, no, we really mean it, right? Um, there is the public there. And then in the United States in particular, there are other parts of the financial regulatory apparatus that are also stakeholders in this, right? Um, so how do we think about um, crisis communication strategy in a world where people were evidently surprised that uninsured deposits meant uninsured and where nobody knew what you know the um, deposit insurance national bank was right in other words these are not just like Look, I can test my students, hi students, by the way, if you're watching, um, on what a DINBI is, but 11 a.m. on the Friday is not a great time to introduce the concept. So how do we get these different messages to different constituents, different stakeholders, in the moment, in crisis? I, we do it in many ways. Um, and I will say, while DENBI may have been the FDI Act buzzword, the buzzword we want everyone to remember is single point of entry. Because single point of entry is the vehicle by which the operating companies continue to go. And it, we have a bridge, and under the bridge, everything is capital, well capitalized and has the liquidity they need. They are open and operating. And so that customers should feel confident that they can continue to do business with them. And that is the main like educational point that I, the key one, I think, in my mind. Um, in terms of communication, I would put it at a couple different crisis communication. There's two different levels for that. First, there's the authority level crisis communication. And we have been working with interagency and with our international key partners for years on this, back from, uh, I worked on it back when I was still at Treasury, for example. Um, and we have playbooks and we've done exercises where we talk, we bring together our comms experts to make sure they all know each other and they know what they would say, what they can say, what they can't say, what would be helpful to say, what would not. 
Um, so that's at the authority level, we just practice. Um, for the company level, it is interesting, and one of the things that we highlight in the paper is the contractors' uh, resources that we have um, put in place in advance. One of those is the rent-a-CEO, as you call it. Um, another one is, con is crisis communication. And we've developed, worked with them. Um, we worked with them last spring. We have playbooks for how the new CEOs should be communicating, how we coordinate that with messages with the FDIC, so that we all sync up and are saying the same thing that is reassuring to the general public, but more they're directed at their employees, for example, making sure that they know that they will be retained um, and that what they should be doing, that their businesses are still open and operating and they should be out there taking care of their clients. Um, and so we've, we, we use that. We have also developed such playbooks in preparation for Title II resolution so that when the CEO lands, they have resources that know what can and can't be said and how to provide uh, communication that is reassuring to markets and other, other um, important parties in this. Recognizing there's going to be a two-way communication. There oh, for be sure. People asking for things. A right lot. There and then. Yeah. yeah. And then obviously we have this for peacetime. Right. And so uh, the chairman at the end of his speech offered for us to do any kind of outreach that uh, people want, and we will take you up on those invitations to come and discuss these plans anytime. So yeah. I the only thing I'd add really quickly is that um, the institutions themselves also have resolution communications plans, and they have a lot of customers, a lot of personnel, and we would absolutely work through them, their communications teams, to help propagate some of this communication at the time. So on the planning, and I feel guilty but not too guilty coming back to the SVB example just because that's the one that happened most recently, those guys had one round of planning. Clearly, one round of planning, and this is FDIA Act. This is not, you know, this is not OLA. With OLA, we've had you know, lots more. But sort of, how much planning does it take to sync up all the plans? Um, and I, I want to take this as a um, also a link to the international dimension, which is you know, the assumption here is that um, a subsidiary or any U.S. entity, right? Um, would uh, of a foreign um, GSIB, uh, the principal responsibility is going to be with the home jurisdiction. But then we could, we the United States could intervene if, if it's not enough, if we don't like it, right? And that too is a planning and communication challenge. So if, if, you know, if you could address that, that would be great. So maybe there are two parts there. One, how many rounds of planning does yes. it take? More than one. Um, and you know, uh, the institutions that failed last spring, it, SVB had just submitted its first plan, and we hadn't completed reviewing it. And as we described, this is a process that takes some iteration to really get all the value out of it. It's not just the document. It's the, so the process. Crisis, right? Yeah. Um, and then on international coordination, in planning, I guess you know this is another place where things have fundamentally changed from 2008. I think it's fair to characterize the situation there as one in which, at the time, there was almost no coordination on advanced resolution planning, and now we're in constant coordination with those authorities. Um, the resources have been pre-placed so that it's not um, about diverging interests. It's uh, clearly in host authorities' best interests to support a single point of entry resolution. If that can work, it's going to result in better outcomes for their creditors. It's going to result in the preservation of operations and you know, um, preserve global financial stability. So I think we put our, ourselves in a position, and we confirm this with, with our peers, that um, this uh, will result it's in their interest to um, coordinate this process rather than have competing resolution processes. Before we. Before I ask Nicola to respond to, to that construct, I did want to ask um, Art, you mentioned in particular the payroll challenge, right? And this is just one example of really some of the structural issues that are involved in resolving a complex institution. And uh, for better or worse, let's say for worse, FDIC is not the only one with fingers in that pot. So. Um, what I'd like to think about is what structural 
reforms, not just communication and, and sort of making people aware of your intentions, but there have certainly been lots of proposals for structural reforms from breaking up the banks to uh, you know, uh, changing the structure of insurance. And uh, in your mind, what is missing in the grand scheme of things um, that could make your job a lot easier? Oh, I, I don't often get asked that question. Um, Merry Christmas. Sorry. No. no. Um, well, let me focus on the depositor aspect of this a little bit. Um, you know, we put out a paper last spring uh, in, on deposit insurance reform options. And, you know, I think one of the points it made was that, um, you know, uh, Nicola referred to last spring sort of undermining market discipline. I think the paper made a distinction of depositor discipline. And in the depositor discipline, you could picture two forms of it. One would be a beneficial one where uninsured depositors monitor the behavior of the managers and the risk takers in advance and, and discipline them that way. Um, the, other time, the other type of depositor discipline is simply the ability to run when you see problems. And it's a, it's a more uh, concerning type of depositor discipline. And that's what we witnessed last, last spring. What, um, what proposals like the long-term debt rule, requiring long-term debt uh, to be at risk in a resolution, um, you get market discipline from parties that cannot run and that have the incentive to monitor and in impose discipline. And I think that's, you know, as you know, we're moving, we've got proposals out to apply that to more firms, and we have uh, also proposals to have more resolution planning for those firms. So I think that it, that's an important uh, step forward. I would say I, I, Nicola made a judgment about which was worse, what we did or what the Swiss did, and I think I heard him say what we did was more damaging. I, I will point out creditors and shareholders of those three banks in the U.S. were wiped out. Um, they, they suffered losses. And you know there haven't been very many examples of large bank failures in an orderly fashion uh, where shareholders and creditors take losses. And so um, you're right, we did use the systemic resolution or systemic risk exception. That shouldn't be part of our normal package, agree, but um, you know it seemed necessary at the time. And Nico, if I could just augment, so. Um, the question to you and, and kind of feed in some of what um, Art was saying. The part of the problem, right, is that the way in which, let's say, Credit Suisse happens, right, affects the expectations of long term debt holders everywhere. And look, I teach contracts, so I read the small print. I love the small print, but it seems like most people don't like the small print, which is what's wrong with them. So, how do you um, clearly say just you should read the small print and then believe that that's what's going to happen is probably not the way. But how do you um, how do you address this at the international level, right? So like our intentions are pretty clear here. Um, how do we make people around the world believe it if the authorities are doing different things in different places? Well, first, I think it's uh, important to mention that uh, there are still a lot of things ongoing in respect to the Credit Suisse story, lawsuits, inquiries, uh, work in the Swiss parliament, work in the Swiss government. So, so I think it's a bit early still now. I think we're to, great at exposed, honey. To, uh, exactly. So um, having said that, my comment was not in terms of comparing the crisis management effectiveness of Switzerland versus the US. Uh, my comment was more holistic, factoring in supervision and everything that comes before things you know, hit the proverbial fan. And I think from that perspective, uh, the US crisis was not a failure of crisis management. So uh, kudos to the FDIC as a crisis manager. Mm -hmm. However, there was a very comprehensive failure of supervision. And also, as uh, Tobias mentioned, 
of crisis preparedness when he mentions this point about you know positioning collateral preparing for liquidity uh, etc so uh, essentially my comment was not about the people on this panel um, but <laughs> by and large even so the FDIC in signature bank was the principal supervisor so that's another division uh, and uh, I think that's uh, that's the point I wanted to make because I think actually in the all things equal, and all things are never equal. In terms of acting early enough, the Swiss authorities acted comparatively earlier than the US authorities, uh, again, simplifying a much more complex picture. They do have two banks. So. Huh? Yeah, they do only have two big banks to work Yeah, but that's, that's also the point. I think the Switzerland is a very small jurisdiction where there were two huge banks, and now there is one. Uh, so it's a bit difficult to compare that with a huge jurisdiction with many banks, and therefore every decision has a precedent effect, including uh, the systemic risk exception, of course. For the Swiss, it's the opposite. When you think about it, from a Swiss perspective, I'm not talking about the international perspective, but you know, we don't have a world government. From a Swiss pers perspective, what they did last year has absolutely zero precedent effect, because thinking about it, this situation will not happen again. We know that. By definition, yes. But that's in some ways the problem, because you don't control the people who set the expectations of the market participants that... Let's make a thought experiment. If we have in the future a situation where the US authorities have to make a decision which sets a precedent internationally but not in the domestic US order, will they care about the precedent setting uh, impact of their decision? I think that's a question, kind of question you have to ask if you want to judge the Swiss kind of with the same yardstick. As, as yeah, as as an, because I don't represent any agency in any way, shape, or form, my answer would be not really, no. But you know, um, what I would love to do is we have seven minutes until hard stop. If you do have a question, um, please I don't know. Do we have a micro? We have a microphone, so please ask it. But if we don't, aha, uh -huh. um, Dr. Adrian. market discipline. So, you know, when you think about Credit Suisse and SVB, perhaps more SVB, you know, depositors did exert pressure eventually, but it seems to me that that did not so like preemptively exert pressure on management, right? Um, I mean, when I think about market discipline, I, I, I would hope that, you know, it preemptively forces management to do the right things. Um, and, you know, if it doesn't do that, clearly one of the three pillars of, reg you know, the Basel regulatory approach has an issue. Um, but on the other hand, the systemic risk exemption perhaps isn't that costly because it doesn't actually distort market discipline because it doesn't work all that well. So I think you're agreeing with me, but when you said that depositor discipline that, that we saw last spring wasn't very helpful or it, because it wasn't exercised in advance, is that what, right? Yeah. Right. So, so that seems to call into question the usefulness of certain of some type of depositor discipline. But I and I think in a paper, the, our options paper, you know, what they made the distinction between was sort of business payment accounts, which you might want to provide more protection to, versus say investment accounts, which. Um, you may not want to because of the sort of moral hazard effects. So I don't know if that, that's something that is worth thinking about. So but go ahead. That was a good question. You're right. No, 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 don't don't take it back. Is, you know. So I don't know whether, you know, so ideally, market discipline would discipline management, but you know the evidence suggests that it may not have been that powerful. And 
you know, in Credit Suisse, I mean, for two years, right? I mean, the balance sheet went from 700 to 500. There were losses, et cetera. You know, did management sort of like act proactively, right? There's also the supervision question. Shouldn't supervisor have been more proactive? And I think Nicola made that point, and you know, we have made that point in in, in papers, et cetera. It's just, you know, what is the role of market discipline? And, you know, the the problem then is, well, then it may not be so costly, but then so like the marketplace as a whole may then say, well, there's going to be bailout anyway, so the systemic risk exemption will be triggered if there's a problem. And so, you know, it doesn't work on the badly behaved management, but for the marketplace as a whole, it may still have a negative impact. Just if I could add the technology dimension to this, there are lots of debates about uh, whether the speed question, which you mentioned, right, which does affect the way in which discipline sort of is exerted, right, was it a technology question, a sociology question, right, you know, you name it. It was probably some combination, right, but. I do think we need to think about kind of the, the channels through which market discipline is exerted. And just to bring it back to GSIBs, you know, we're, uh, we're all banking on long-term debt. Is that sort of the story? Um, or is there, are there other channels, right? And uh, you know, to your point about systemic risk exception, we have exactly four that I counted, right? And that's apart from systemic risk designation, from systemic risk designation. So, you know, could, do we blame Aunt Agatha for not following? I, that was not the, that last question was my existential creed occur. Sorry. Um, the technology and speed question. Yeah, no, I think, look. yeah, a lot of people have pointed to that as being different from uh, spring. There are others who argue that it wasn't that much different, that WAMU, when it failed, the, the, the deposits were leaving very quickly. We had to close it on Continental a Thursday Illinois night. Was. Continental <laughs> Illinois, they, you know, they say, you know, so, you know, that's up in the air. On the systemic risk exception, I, I don't know that um, it sounds like you think that last spring shows that that's always going to be invoked or an option. I don't think you can count on that. You know, it, it requires super majorities of the Federal Reserve Board and the FDIC Board. And it was, it was not at all clear last spring after those first two, whether we would have another systemic risk exception. And it turns out we didn't have one when we handled First Republic. Um, but I don't think you can count on that being uh, always available. What about the channels? Is it all long-term debt? The well, channels and market discipline for... Well, um, I think that's an important one. And I think um, if, if shareholders know that they are going to be wiped out, that's an another important one. Um, you know, and demonstrating that, that that's the intention and, and, and the practice in these cases should be helpful. Um, and, and for management to know that they will be held accountable. So I, I hope all of those are, are in play. So we have a hard stop. So I would love to just ask each of you if there is anything that we haven't covered that we absolutely must. I would and just your closing thoughts. And then we thank our panelists. I don't think there's anything that we absolutely must cover, um, but I do think your questions about communications are well taken. That's part of why we're doing this. Um, communications at the time, I'm not, I think that this process conceptually is actually not as complex as it at first appears, um, but having everybody understand what it means for them and doesn't mean for, for them is going to be a real challenge, and so we're trying to do some of that in advance, and that's why we're here. Thank you so much. Maybe to conclude, I'd like to uh, quote uh, what Marty, uh, Chair Grunberg, uh, told us earlier today. Um, Resolution of a GSIB is a tough decision, I quote him, to make even in the best of circumstances. I think that's a key insight. It's never going to be you know, clean and happy. Uh, and, uh, and even with the best preparation, and I don't want to sound cynical here, this is really helpful. It is helpful for market discipline. It is helpful for a future outcome. So, so it's a great uh, endeavor. And by this, by the way, I mean the paper that is published today uh, by the FDIC. But the fact of the matter is even after Credit Suisse, 
we still don't have a case of resolution being triggered for GCIFs. That's a fact. Since GCIFs have existed, which is the early 2010s, as a designation. Um, this may happen one day. We don't know not how. But I think one thing we know is that authorities will be reluctant to be the first test case. And to me, that's a big lesson of the Swiss case. Again, no taxpayers' money uh, spent, even so taxpayers' money was committed. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think as long as authorities have a way to escape that test case, they will continue to try their best. So maybe we shouldn't have GSIPs. Um, thank you so much. Uh, this has been incredibly rich. And let us thank our panelists and audience. <laughs>